guys, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, uh, Nick for hosting us. Uh, my name is Bobby Ramsey. I'm the head football coach at, at Mandarin High School. We're in a 8A program down here in, in Jacksonville, south portion of Jacksonville, Florida, and kind of a continuation of, of what we talked about last time, where I just kind of introduced generally um, our, our four down philosophy. Um, you know how we how we install uh, teaching progressions, practice schedules, um, why we like it, things like that. Personnel, how we look for different kind of kids. And this is going to be a little bit more specific to defending the spread, which, you know, could you could say, coach, that's every week. And, yeah, a lot of times it is. Um, but we're going to talk about the different kinds of spread, the different things that you can do, uh, the varieties that are out there, ways to defend it, the variety of spread offenses and some ways that you can combat them out of a four down defense, uh, especially now with the onset of RPOs and things like that. Uh, I know the three down front has become uh, popular and and. Certainly, there's some good stuff out there, but we're going to focus mainly on four down here, um, you know, with with majority zone coverage behind it and it sort of just give a general template for for uh, defending wide open offense. I'm a big believer that you, you have to give yourself a series of questions to ask um, when when you do anything. Uh, uh, the why is important. And in addition to that, I think the questions that templates that you can create will allow you to better organize your thoughts and will allow you to better break down your opponent. So when you're going against a spread team, I think the first thing you need to ask is why are they spreading you out? Okay. Most people think, you know, the, the spread was designed, uh, you know, to create opportunity to run the football. Well, make sure that you are charting the run pass down distance formations, all that stuff. So you can figure out if that is in fact true because that may give you an idea of what you want to do in the box with your two backers. Um, do you want to detach your wheel? Do you want to keep guy in the box? Uh, you know, wh why are they in the spread? Um, are they airing it out? This gives you an opportunity to decide what kind of zone you want to play. What are their favorite concepts, such and such. How are you going to defend zone read? Um, you know, and within that now also what's become popular power read. How are you going to defend those plays? How are you going to fit those plays? Those are option plays. And I think it's important that you have responsibilities tied in uh, with every player so that you can uh, everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, when talking specifically now about zone read, basically what it comes down to is how do you want to play it with your defensive end? OK, is he going to chase the ball or is he going to play the quarterback? And what I would say is the answer to that question, uh, how you want to play it is the answer is who do you want to have the football? If you want the quarterback to have the ball, um, you know, then he's going to chase the running back. If you want the running back to have the ball, then he's going to sit on the quarterback. The way the offense has evolved, um, it's it's become much more, uh, you know, teams want to throw the ball more out of it. And you, you don't have as many of those dual threat guys who are really scary when they pull the ball and run with it. Uh, I think that, that maybe you used to where teams were just putting their best athlete back there and go and spread. It seems like teams want to throw the ball more and quarterbacks are handing it off out of the zone read a lot more. So that may change your thought process. I know for myself, I used to be a big force to give guy. Now I've become a big um, let's force the pull and the quarterback who's probably the less talented athlete of the two. Let's have him run with the ball. Um, is the quarterback a run threat? Uh, is he an insert guy? Should you flush him? How does he like to scramble? I think that's important. Make sure that you know what the scrambling tendencies are of the quarterback that you're going against. Quarterbacks have different areas that they like to get out of the pocket. Some guys like to step up and find the bubble and go. Um, some guys like to try to spin out and reverse out and go opposite their throwing hand. A lot of quarterbacks who are right-handed most of the time are going to want to scramble to their right. Determine where the guy likes to scramble so you can develop your pass rush plan and communicate that properly to your defensive line and work them uh, during the week. Um, you know, if he's a guy that likes to step up, well, then you probably want to look at some inside pressures and some heavier rushes from your defensive lineman. So now when he does step up, there's bodies in front of him. Now he has to scramble out, which he doesn't like. Um, when I say, is he an insert guy? Are they running? Is he a bigger quarterback? They're maybe going to be running uh, some power read stuff with and things like that. Or is he more of an elusive guy? So chart that. I think that's really important. Um, are they a midline team? You know, do they run the midline out of gun? Are they reading your three technique? How much do you need to slow him down? How how much do you need to work with him 
uh, on how you want to defend that, the gap switches with your three technique and your mic, how you're going to fit the midline. Are they a veer team? All right. Are they gun out of, are they veer out of gun? Again, how are you going to defend that? Um, how are you going to fit that? Are you going to have multiple ways to play that? When you move your defensive lineman, how does that change the fit and the responsibility? If your team likes to stunt, then you need to make sure you fit those plays and you know the players are taught um, who has what player, quarterback, running back, based on what you've called. Does the back alignment tip, run, or pass? Um, a lot of times when the back is even with the quarterback or slightly up, it's a pass, all right? When he's behind him and tight, it's a run. So get that tendency. Find where that back is. I think that's so important. Where is the running back? What side of the quarterback is he on? What is his depth? What is his alignment? Is he wide? Okay, if he's wide and even, he still might be coming back this way. If he's wide and up, uh, you know, you're, you're probably looking at a pass. Again, going back to wide and even, uh, you know, power read, most likely not a zone read. Uh, situation behind and close it's probably going to be zone read if they run it do they stay in the same personnel or do they sub uh do they go 11 personnel or do they go 10 personnel do they do they sub a tight end and out when they go two back do they bring a, a you know slot guy back in the backfield this will give you an opportunity if they do sub to set the personnel that you want out on the field um do they have certain players when they do come in they run this uh, this guy doesn't play a whole lot of offense. He mostly plays defense, but when he's in the game, this is happening. Uh, look into that. Make sure that you know. So that way when you're tagging your personnel groups, uh, just because it's two by two doesn't mean it's 10 personnel. It could be 11 personnel. It could be 20 personnel. Um, look into that. Make sure just because it's 11 personnel or a, you know, a, a three, three wide receiver set with a tight end and a, a running back does not mean it's 11 personnel. Maybe they just bring – their slot guy, the, a big, bigger slot receiver, an H-back guy, bring him down. Um, just because they have that offset back, that H-back and that running back, does not mean it's necessarily 20 personnel. That might be 11 personnel. So make sure that you get that. So if you are a big personnel tendency team, you're not calling things just based on the formation. You're calling it based on who is actually in the game. And get those numbers, all right? 84 is this guy. 42 is this guy. Uh, 26, 12. 13 of their receivers, whatever. Make sure that you get that. What's their quick game like? Um, you know, are they a big uh, slant flat team? Are they are they throwing the now stuff? Are they throwing the bubble stuff? What's their quick game like? Uh, what's their screen and bubble game like? Do they like to run the tunnel screens? Um, are they are they more of a running back screen? Uh, you know, do, are they going pre snap? They see two over two throwing bubble automatic. How are how are they doing that? And then how do you want to combat that? Um, you know, in terms of how you want to run your coverages and where do you want to put your numbers maybe to deter if you don't want the bubble throw. So what kind of screen game are they running? What kind of bubble game are they running? What down and distances are they like in their screen game? Are they a big second and long? Hey, we're going to go screen to try to get it back. Uh, will they screen you on first and 10? Do they like screen inside the red zone because they think you're bringing pressure and they want to catch you in a blitz? Does the back stay in a protector? Does he get out in the routes? You know, um, that that's big. If he's staying in, then that to me means that you want to try to dial up more five-man pressures and try to bring more guys. That way it's one less uh, receiver that you have to account for. Uh, is he check releasing? What's he doing? What are their favorite passing concepts? I'm always a big believer. Go after their top five pass concepts. Chart them, and that's what you want to spend the majority of your time on. Don't spend too much time on plays that they do not run well. Um they may only run something two or three times a game, but if they're really good at it, well, then make sure you spend a lot of time trying to stop it. Um, focus on what they do well and what they are productive with. I, I, I don't know that you, you can have the time and practice to defend every single concept teams run because teams throw a lot of different stuff at you with tagging different routes in different concepts. I mean, you can run flood a lot of different ways. You can run high, low stuff a lot of different ways. And as, as a DC be careful about how much time you spend on everything, all right? Invest in what they do well and what they do most. Do they like to attack the middle of the field? A lot of teams don't, you know, quarterbacks don't like to throw between the hash marks. Um, a lot of room to make a mistake. Uh, a lot of bodies in there. A lot of times they want to throw the ball to their right or to their left. If they don't attack the middle of the field, you need to get your inside linebacker involved in some pressures, okay? What blitzes do we like, all right? Based on their protections, based on their run game, what blitzes do we like? What stunts do we like? All right. 
What what have we seen them struggle with? What twist games? What movements? All right. Do they struggle when when defensive linemen cross face? Do they outweigh you? Okay. If that's the case, you want to give your defensive lineman a chance. You want them to get them moving. Can we press their wide receivers? Um, and in addition to that, who is their guy? Who do we got to take away? Who do you got to limit? All right. I'm a big believer that you need to limit the other team's best players as much as you can. If you go into the game thinking that they've lit everybody else up, but they won't light you up, to me, you're making a mistake. Force other people to beat you. Don't let the other team's best player beat you. I'm not saying he's not going to make plays or not have a good game, but force other guys to beat you. If you can press their wide receivers and disrupt the timing and spacing of of the passing game, go for it. Um, If you feel like it's a physical mismatch or if you can beat the line of scrimmage, your guys can't catch up, Give respect to those guys. If those guys run really well, give them some respect. Now, the flip side logic to that is, well, maybe you want to get down and challenge those guys, um, you know, and not give the receiver room off the line of scrimmage to make your guy miss. So it really comes down to, I think, what your personal belief is. Um, Are they up tempo or they just no huddle? You know, nobody huddles anymore. Uh, I, I get that. Almost nobody huddles anymore. But how are they using the how are they using tempo? Are they trying to go fast, fast, fast? Okay. Are they going, you know, Auburn speed? Or are they just, you know, a, a, a spread offense who's going to come to line of scrimmage and do the check with me stuff, uh, get the signal in from the sideline, maybe try to give you a fake call and get the play and see how you line up so the coordinator can make what he thinks is the right call. Uh, that that is important for how you set your practices. If they go fast, then you got to make sure that you set those periods of practice so your guys can get used to getting the call quickly from the sideline. And also your coaches know, unless the ball has gone out of bounds or been thrown incomplete or a penalty has been called, you can't sub when the ball is moving, when the ball is between the, uh, the white stripes. Are they 10 or 11 all the way down the field? And what I mean by that is, you know, when they get inside the, the, the 12, 20 yard line, or the 10-yard line, do they bring in a big body? Do they bring in a tight end? What is your bunch check? I'm not a big believer in having too many of those, but I do think you need to have a bunch check, and it needs to be consistent. And then lastly, how are you going to defend empty? Okay? How are you going to defend empty? A lot of that, I think, comes down to how athletic that quarterback is. Okay? Um, one of the things I think that made LSU so tough is that when they would go empty, uh, your teams would vacate seven defenders and leave three down and one inside backer. And Joe Burrow, a lot of times, will make him pay for it. I know we don't go against Joe Burrow on a week-in, week-out basis, but you still have got to account for that quarterback run when they go empty because that can really hurt you. Defensive communication structure or structure of communication. Know the signals, okay? Echo the call, stress this in practice. We talked about that in the last presentation. I think this is something that gets missed a lot of the time. I think this is something that players get in the game. They get tired. They get lazy. They don't get the call. They just assume it's going to be the same call again. You end up with misalignments. You end up with two gap uh, plays where now you're giving up a gap in in the run game because you got a D lineman and a linebacker in the same gap. Uh, You end up not adjusting right to the call. You end up having someone not go on a pressure. I think this is something that needs to be hammered home every single day. It is critical. Communication on defense is critical. Every day you have to stress it. Don't just assume the players have gotten good at it. Kind of talked about defending the zone read. It's no different than any other option, okay? You've got to have a dive, a quarterback, and a pitch player, which may be a bubble, but you still have to have everybody doing that. And we kind of talked about it earlier. If the end has QB, the backer has the running back, the advantage to that is that run, that linebacker, nothing really changes for him. He's running, okay? He's running like he always does. He sees that he's got an offset back, so he's thinking zone – Away from me, he sees that zone block from the guard, the back action that way, he can pull the chain and go, okay? If he's fitting quarterback, all right, now he's got to talk to himself and know that offset back's my way. Now I got to make sure that I slow down on uh, on run away from me. Uh, if the end or if the end, if the end has the running back, that's what I said. The backer has to hang for quarterback. Um, if the backer is detached, if you send your will out of the box, all right, to me that's an automatic now the, the – to the offset backside, that line, uh, line, excuse me, defensive lineman has got to know I am chasing. I have the running back in zone read. Okay. Um, again, those D linemen need to know where the back is. We, we talked about that. Where that back is is critical. If the back's offset my way, I got to be thinking zone read. Okay. 
If the back's offset away from me, then I'm thinking power read. Um, and I think that's important. The same thing with the inside the, uh, defensive lineman. Um, if that back's, if I'm off on the side of the offset back, I'm the three technique. Okay. I got to be ready for that tackle to come down. Um, so maybe as a defensive play call, you want to do something to help that tackle out. There are three technique out. So that tackle doesn't wash them all the way down and give the back an easy cutback. So think about those things when you, when you call your stunts, uh, where that back is could determine what kind of twist games you want to run, what kind of slant games you want to run, uh, especially on first down, second and, and medium, what downs you have determined that are run downs. Midline veer. I, I like to keep it pretty simple. Our three techniques going to take the dive. Mike's going to go to quarterback. Okay. If we do run a movement, which we call stun Mike, where the three technique is now going to the a gap, the mic loops to the B. Okay. So if we run rebel, which is a five and a three stunt where the, the shade and the, or the, should be the three technique and the five technique are slanting five techniques going B three techniques going a, all right. The mic now becomes if the back is offset to the side of the stunt, the mic now becomes the quarterback player. You, you, you have to, you really have to rep that, especially if you've got a mic who's used to being a tackle tackle to guy and getting downhill. And I think this is important. I talked about it last week. I'll stress it again. Do job one before you do job two, okay? Make sure that you do not try to get to second before you step to first. Get the call. Line up properly. Eyes on my assignment. Step where you're supposed to step. Put your hands where they're supposed to go. You have to do all those things before you can get off the block and go make a tackle. Secondary run fits. When you're talking about your nickel, your Sam, whatever, uh, we have a beat it or bust it call. If that number two is wide, okay, say we're in, in, a, in a, three, a two by two set and that number two is, you know, further than five yards out of the, out from the offensive tackle. All right. We want to do what's called um, bust it, which means we're going to get upfield. All right. If we want to beat it, all right, then that means we're going to play over top. The change becomes how your safety is going to fit off of that. Okay. If you're working, if you're nickel or you're Sam or whatever you want to call that guy, your star monster, whatever, if he's going to try to contain and get to the outside shoulder, then that safety needs to come down there and fit in the alley. Um, and I think the question you have to ask yourself is again, the width of number two and how much pressure do you want to put on your safety? Number two is really wide. I don't want my, my Sam or my nickel trying to work over top of the outside shoulder because I'm putting a lot of pressure on my, on my free safety to come down there and play a lot of space against what could be a really good back. Okay. So figure out based on the split and how much space you want your uh, defender to account for your back end guy. Cause I really think you got to think about your safeties a lot um, and how to protect them. Cause they got a tough job. How do you want them to fit the run? What's the most difficult thing for them? Um, you know, I, if you can get upfield and force that ball to bubble, then I think that's what you do and allow your safety time to determine the proper angle, get downfield, and then go make a play. The multitude of spreads. These are kind of the different ways we classify them. Uh, you know, are they a traditional OU style, air raid, 10 personnel, zone read, quick pass, mesh, things like that? Um, are they RPO based? Are they a team that runs a lot of RPOs? Are they Auburn style, which is a little bit more run based, more QB runs, more speed sweeps? some more unique formations, a lot of 20 personnel, okay? Are they wing T style? People have gone to gun wing T, all right? What do they do? Are they a Wildcat team? I know Wildcat's kind of phased out lately, but, um, you know, when I first presented on this several years ago, Wildcat was kind of becoming in vogue. Um, I used to be the head coach at Uly High School. We had Derrick Henry, we ran some Wildcat for sure. So um, if, you, if they do run Wildcat, guys, you need to make sure that you adjust to that and fit that accordingly, okay? because it creates a numbers disadvantage for you on defense. And it's important that you make sure that you get down and get the numbers proper and get the players to understand someone has got to beat a block if you are going to defend that play. B gap sound, um, you know, doubles empty, your Sam, your nickel and your will are gonna go out of the box. Tango, great stunt to fix that. Um, and I have a, a card on that I'll show here uh, in a little bit. Um, you can make a read call. If it's past the end contains, all right. If it's reach block, down block, or base block by the tackle, he's going B gap. If all right, and spills run his way to the outside linebacker. So basically, he's reading runner pass. 
pass I contain, run I take, B-gap. All right, these are things you can do and help you out also if you're trying to vacate the box to stop an RPO team. All right, being a team that has an offense that runs a lot of RPOs, I can tell you, teams run RPOs to want to throw the football. All right, put them in a situation where they run it a few times and see if they'll stick with it. I would, I would, I would kind of call their bluff on that, so to speak. I'm a big believer in disguising. Uh, try to show your favorite shell as much as possible. If you're a single high team, try to show single high as much as you can. If you're a quarters team, try to show quarters as much as you can. All right, don't let the other team's offensive coordinator be able to tee off on your coverage and make the right call because so many of these offenses are check with me offenses where the offensive coordinator is trying to basically make the right call based on what he thinks you're lined up in. So do your best to disguise this, and, and it's 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 critical, okay, that, that you harp on the little things. If your safety is supposed to be at nine, make sure they're at nine. If you're playing a two look and then they get back to 12, it's going to be easier for that OC to make a call to hurt you. So make sure that they understand the importance of disguising. Personnel. I'm a big fan of, of, of not substituting a whole lot on defense. Um, I'm not saying that you can't substitute from series to series. I do think you can do that. But when teams are going fast, it's really hard to be able – to sub guys on and off. And that's one thing with your, as far as limiting your penalties on the sideline and making sure your coaches understand if a team's going fast and the ball's in play, you know, we can't be subbing. All right. Especially if they haven't subbed, if they've subbed, the umpire is going to stand over the ball. You have an opportunity to do that. But most of the time, uh, you know, the, your position coaches are not seeing if they've subbed or not. So it's important that they understand when they can and can't sub. Balls on the far hash, tougher to sub. Limit mass subs. The more guys you bring on and off, the likelihood of you getting 12 men on the field becomes higher. Um, and don't sub inside the 10. That's a long way for a guy to have to make a run, especially if the ball's on the far hash and you're trying to make a substitution to get the right guy on the field. You're going to get caught with a 12 men on the field penalty or probably have to take a timeout. So think about that when you're, um, you know, when you're creating your substitution patterns and how you want to do that. Make sure that you have a group of 11 that can play in any situation, all right? So you don't have to do too much substitution within a series. And in high school football, I, I, you know, my, my take is I don't know that you're going to have a whole lot of teams that are going to be able to, to run a tried and true dime package. Um, I would tell anybody or a nickel package, if your fifth or if your sixth defensive back is better than one of your two inside linebackers, then he needs to be one of your two inside linebackers. Yeah, he needs to be on the field. Coverages, and this is basically uh, what we run a lot of, uh, your true zones. Uh, like I said last pre presentation, we're a big quarters team. Uh, we do mix a three, uh, and, and it's really a three mat Ripley's match in there, uh, and sync, which is just a soft cover two. Um, with your man zone pattern match stuff, which we do a lot of, um, you know, palms, trio, and mini, which a lot of people do, although ours is a little different. I'll show it to you. And then our, our man coverages, which one single high, you know, funnel and everything to the free safety, no big whoop, and gold, which is zero, where we're going to be on inside leverage trying to funnel everything out. We do not want to get beat inside and zero cover. No matter what zone, I think, guys, there's some things that are important. All right, leverage matters. Are you an inside-out player or outside-in? Are you trying to force the guy inside or are you trying to force the guy outside? All right, because that a lot of times determines where your help – you. Is based on where your help is, and you want to funnel things to your help. Be physical. Be physical. Again, we play on Fridays. We don't play on Sundays. All right? Be physical. Hands on. Reroute. All right? You can knock them down. It's not a penalty. You can't hold them. You can't tackle them. All right? But a guy's crossing your face, you can dance or give him a shot. If he falls down, he falls down. Communication. Crossers. Calling out switches, especially if you're a team – that likes to pattern match, which is what we do main majority of. Make sure you're communicating. Formation checks, all right? We got bunch, check bunch, check bunch, things of that nature. And make sure that your kids understand we're covering deep to short. In any situation, if you can get two guys on a deep route to force the quarterback to take his check down, do it, all right? A four-yard, five-yard pass is not going to get you beat. A 45-yard pass will get you beat. Cover four. Simple. Read two, C1, pass five, he's yours. All right. Corners are seven by one inside. They're bailing at the snap. Safeties are 10 by two. They're on inside leverage. All right. They're slow pedaling. 
All right, they're getting their run pass read from the offensive tackle and going from there. Linebackers are skiff players, which means seam curl flat. Their priority is the seam. After that to the curl, lastly to the flat. Okay. Again, we want the ball to be thrown down there. We'll rally to that and tackle it. If it's a short down and distance that we're probably in a man coverage, we have somebody out there. If we get trips, free safety is going to apex two and three, and our backside safety, our outlaw, or our bandit, we call it now here um, at, at Mandarin, uh, he's going to make a stretch call, which means he's moving towards the football. All right. He's still primary force backside, so he can't go too far, but he's eyeballing number three unless the call, call unless we're in a quarter, quarter, half look, and now he's bracketing the number one receiver. Skiff, just like I talked about, that means seam, curl, flat. Those are the priorities. If my man's right, if all right, if I'm inside of number two and I'm the Sam, number two's going vertical, I'm running, I'm carrying that, carrying that, I'll work to the curl, all right, after the seam has passed me, okay? But I'm going to get hands on and run with that and get my eyes towards number one and see what's going on. If he curls, then I'll go to it. If not, I might as well just keep carrying this and we'll get to the flat late, plus I know my mic can help me in that. Okay. Rip Liz match. I like this as a compliment to cover four. Okay. Because the rules are similar for the corners. If you get a team that likes to go two by two and run the football, this is a good first down call. I wouldn't run it on third down and long. Um, it keeps you safe against four verticals. Um, you know, so it's something that I would definitely consider if you're a, uh, if you're a cover four team. We don't live in it. So we're not maybe as uh, intricate as Alabama is with it. But I do think it's a nice call to get hitters down into the box and keep you safe. If you do get, um, you know, a team that's going to see in single high and go, okay, we're going to run four verts at them uh, because you can now match that on the short on the short side uh, away from the Sam, uh, you know, with your outlaw carry number two. Um, and unless he gets an undercall, and in that case now, uh, your, your corner is getting depth to his divider and he's going to be helping on that vertical from number two. Okay, versus trips. Um, Mike's got three in the flat. Our monster, who's our 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 nickel, yeah. um, to that side, will work with the Mike. Uh, two inside becomes new number three. Mike takes it. Monster takes new number two back, which would be old number three. Okay, if you want to go cover three versus three by one, what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our monster, who's your nickel, Sam, whatever you want to call him. He's going to go outside of number two. All right. And our mic is going to adjust, and he's got three up. Okay, three on the rail, he carries it. Your outlaw, your backside safety, again, he's a more physical guy. He's a little more versatile. He's going to come down into the box. He's got your offset back away on the bubble. He's your screen player. All right, you can press your boundary corner because he's not going to – he shouldn't have a ton of help. So we probably want to have to push this guy to the sideline. Um, tell your mic, number three goes away, Number new number three is coming back. All right, so number three goes away, start working, start working, look for something coming back, curl something in that, at, that area where no, new number three is coming back in the form of number two, who's now going to hook up on you or something like that. Okay, sink is what I talked about earlier. That's basically just cover two. Um, corners reading one to two. Safety's looking two to one. Linebackers are skiff. Okay, this is not a hard, you know, funnel the outside shoulder, number one, hands-on kind of deal. Um, corner's going to be off. Uh, he's going to be five yards off. And on the outside shoulder, number one, if one goes vertical, okay, he's going to carry it. All right. If one goes away, he's going to look for two coming back. I I'm a, I'm a fan of games guys, as opposed to, uh, you know, bringing six man pressures. I think they can be as effective and they're less risky. Although I did talk about earlier, if you can get a fifth rusher, if you can steal a fifth rusher, do it. All right. Especially if, if it's a situation where the back is not terribly active in protection, you can create five one-on-ones and allow your guys who are trained to pass rush, go rush the passer. Um, and this is just an example of some of the games that we run here. Um, that you, There's a variety. Uh, your slants. Tango is a read, and I'll show that one here in a second. Okay, this is base pick, okay, which is a movement between your, your, your five and your, and your nose guard. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I don't have, I wish I had some practice clips to kind of show you the five footwork changes. Um, it's a lateral step with your inside foot from the end. Okay. And he's reading the guard down. All right. He's going to rotate his hips and rip hard across the tackle. He's getting into the B gap. Nose guard is your looper. 
base pirate here is a long twist game. Your three and your five are going B gap and A gap, and the nose is looping around. Now, um, the nose is reading it. He's only looping if it's pass. If it's run, he's going to play A gap. This is a good stunt to run. If you're, if you're getting a lot of zone read and the back is offset to the three and the five side, okay? You've got good chase from your end and your tackle. If it's pass, you're protected contain-wise because now your nose is looping. But he only loops if it's pass. So make sure you coach him hard to get his, his run pass read right. Reason I say that is a lot of times this call will be made, the nose guard will just want to loop around and think it's pass. Make sure that you coach him hard to get his run pass read before he gets out of there. Base pop. Uh, this is a good stunt to run if the back is away from the three and the five. All right, what you're having here is you're getting a good hard charge from your three technique, hopefully cutting off the zone if it's coming this way, all right? And you're in working back inside, hopefully to be there when the ball cuts back, okay? This is a way to sort of force the running back to make a decision a little sooner than having your defensive end set the edge. Now basically your three technique has become your edge setter, okay? So it's very important that he gets through that outside shoulder. He can widen a little bit, go tip of the pad, tip of the pad, get up the field in that gap and force that ball to cut back, hopefully to a nose guard who's pushing that center in, all right? And also to a uh, three a defensive end who's now cross face and coming up field into the A-gap. Um, that's a good stunt you can run against RPO teams, especially if you take your will out of the box and you've made, uh, maybe you're slowing your mic down to be a backside B-gap player. Base rush. Um, this is the call. This is basically where we tell the defensive lineman, you know, this is like we're, you're uh, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, whatever. We're calling a play for you. All right. There is no read here. This is a, this is a, uh, we're going to widen out. We're going to get the quarterback. This is passing situation. This is third and long. Okay. We don't want to get too wide. We want to go tip of the pad, tip of the pad. All right. Our eyes are on the ball, not the man. They're almost always on the man. All right. Unless we have a stunt called. Um, like rush, all right? So rush is the only time that we tell the kids that you can put your eye on the ball because we're trying to beat the offensive lineman to a spot in the protection. Um, here I have some cut-ups. We talked about three match earlier, being able to count for two verticals uh, from your inside two receivers. Here they're in 12 personnel. Oops. All right, we're in Rip Liz match. Again, we could steal a fifth. If you could steal a fifth rusher, steal him. Their back stays in to protect. Linebacker sees it, so he brings it. All right, safety turns his shoulders a little bit. Again, this is this is game film. This is not necessarily um, all world teach tape. But he does make sure that he funnels number two back towards the free safety. They're going four verts on us, and we get two guys on the ball where it's being thrown. Again, if you can get two men on a deep route, do it. Free safety sees where the quarterback's looking, breaks on the ball. All right, and again, I talked about in the last presentation, that free safety was a heck of an offensive player for us. He did not get a ton of time at wide receiver, or at defensive back, excuse me, and we coached him, hey man, play free safety like you play wide receiver. Go for the ball like you would a wide receiver. All right, he gets a great deflection by his, his uh, bandit there. But we make that a tough throw for the quarterback. You got two guys on that on that route right there. That's what you want. All right. Apologize for some of the choppiness here. Again, single high scenario. Bring in a fifth. Their protection was kind of screwy. We got two guys on the weak side. They're sliding away from the pressure, so nobody blocks them. Good look here. It's past situation, so two-man surface. We allow our defensive end to get a two-point stance. All right, we're coming. We're showing our wheels down. Offensive tackle is, is in a situation where he's got to block somebody. He doesn't block anybody. 
Okay, first and ten. Again, two man sir. Uh, <clears throat> First and 10, slant call. Defensive end gets inside. Now we make the ball bubble. That's a fast kid. He's at Ole Miss. He's going to be at Ole Miss this fall. Secondary force is good. All right. Wildcat formation. We talked a little bit about it earlier. Defending Wildcat. Inside the 10 is when you might get this. Wait, we got 10 guys playing run. And the receiver doesn't give much effort in the block. We know he's not going to throw it. The corner's over there. Eyes inside. Knows it's going to be run. Selling out on the football. Not letting it get outside. Beating blocks. Guys got to beat blocks when you're defending Wildcat. Okay, I didn't put this in the uh, PowerPoint, but this is special. Again, I said we don't vacate five out of the uh, – or excuse me, we don't vacate the box very often. Um, in this case, we did. So we brought our, our Will linebacker out over number three. Good controlled rush right there. We don't get too far past the quarterback. That's what I like up top from the defensive end. Don't run around the quarterback. Shut it down. That's a nice spy rush from our uh, from our shade right there. This kid could scramble. We needed to make sure we had a good plan. Kids didn't run around the quarterback. Defensive lineman stayed in front of him. Nicely done. Okay, here we go. Here's some pressures again. Steal a fifth if you can. Five on five up front. Running back doesn't really want to block anybody. Create those one-on-one -on -one matchups. So I was saying earlier, I, I don't know. You know, offensive plays, I think, are designed to get the ball on players in one-on-one -on -one situations. I believe with pass rush, you're trying to get your defensive lineman in one-on-one -on -one situations as best you can. I don't know that you can always dial up a free player. All right, that puts a lot of pressure on you as a coordinator. These guys are coached and taught how to rush the passer. Let me get them one-on-one -on -one and out-athlete that big guy because they should be able to do that. And when you bring a fifth, you create that opportunity. Here's our end zone shot, which was from the ground because we couldn't get the camera elevated work. Our cord broke. Hands and feet traveling together in pass rush. 55 is a heck of a football player. Uses his speed, doesn't run around the quarterback, shuts it down when he gets to his outside shoulder, finishes him off. Okay, three by one. Man, if you can bring that backside safety and you feel good with your coverage on the short side, bring him. Running backs oftentimes do not want to block. I would like my defensive end to be more on the outside shoulder down here at the bottom. We have everything covered. We got the verticals taken care of. All right, number seven here probably should have saw new number three coming in, but that's okay. That's a long developing route. If it gets there, I got to put that one on the defensive line. Here it is again from the end zone. That's a wide call. 
I did not put that in the PowerPoint. I like the active hands for 55. 63 takes a little bit too much of a wide path to begin with. He's already outside. Should be coming more at the outside shoulder of the offensive tackle. Young kid, really good football player now. Okay, this is tough, which is a, a heavy technique that we play at times. We're being strict nose to shoulder pad with all of our defensive linemen trying to get a good piece of those OLs so the linebackers can run, it works out perfectly. Good force from number six, linebacker running inside out. 63 does a great job. Again, heavy techniques. reason I put this on here, we have a pressure call and it, we don't do a very good job, but I wanted to show how 55 played counter right here. I think that's how you want to play a puller. Stay square, contact him with your inside shoulder, get underneath that block, make a tackle. I'm not a big fan of wrong arming. I think you're trading one for one. Yeah, if you would have spilled it, four sitting right there, but four doesn't do a great job on the pressure. That defensive end knows he's got a chance to make a tackle. He's got to do job one first. He's got to play the guard. All right, here we go. We talk about defending empty. We went special. Brought pressure. And what I like about this here, guys, is how our free safety again i know he's undercutting the ball and you're probably going out oh, make me nervous i made me nervous too um but he sees six shut it down he gets back over top of number three and then our corner diagnosed it over there we get two guys around the football i mean that's heck of a football player making a great play if you get two-way players guys they play predominantly one side of the ball. My advice, try to get them to play the other side of the ball like they play their main position. You got a guy that plays a lot of receiver, he's a DB, play it like you would receiver, buddy. Okay, I talked about different kinds of uh, spreads. This is one that was a heavy run team that had the leading rusher in the, in the Jacksonville area. We're playing man in this instance. Corner's got to be able to play blocks nowadays, guys. Too many teams try to run outside of you. 21 gets turned a little bit, but I like that he sets an edge. He also takes on two blockers. Good inside-out pursuit. Okay, back off, set my... Uh, Excuse me, we talked about certain types of stunts. You think you're getting power read. Okay, slant weak works great. Our defensive end gets in the B gap, gets upfield, forces things to bubble. Our backside defensive end crosses face. Excuse me, this is a, 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 a gap call. We're going gap here. Trying to spill the football. Force guys stay outside. All right, we don't we don't make any bones about it. We get in the gaps. I heard a coach tell me one time, I don't care if he knows where you're going, you got to get there. He's still got to block you. Big kid, a little hard time moving his feet. 
Take gaps away inside. Guys, here's my contact info. Also, the contact info of our defensive coordinator. His email address is down there at the bottom, Jermaine Wilson. Um, any questions, anything I, I, I can do or point you in the direction, I'm, I'm glad to do it. Uh, also, my Twitter on there on my cell. Feel free to reach out. Um, love talking football. Love talking to coaches and, and seeing how people do different things and, and learning and getting better myself. I certainly don't have all the answers. That's why we um, are fortunate to have these online uh, forums and, and information that we get access to to learn a lot. So thanks a lot, guys, and uh, take care. Good luck this fall. Hopefully everybody stays safe.